Inshallah, starting Juz 9 today. Uh, the ending of Juz 8, we have the stories of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a lot of short stories of Salih alayhi salam, Lut alayhi salam, Shu'ib alayhi salam. And he mentions them uh, just briefly about you know their interactions with their nations and how their nations they had difficulty with. So the first ayah of the ninth Juz, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, the arrogant chiefs of the people threatened, meaning the arrogant chiefs of Shu'ib alayhi salam, uh, uh, continuing from the eighth Juz. The chiefs from Shu'ib alayhi salam's tribe, they said, O Shu'ib alayhi salam, we will certainly expel you and your fellow believers from our land unless you return to our play, our, our faith. So Shu'ib alayhi salam replied, even if we hate it, expulsion of people, uh, even if we hate it. So he said that, uh, he said, even if we dislike this, he said, yes. So important thing for us to uh, see here is from the time of the prophets till now, you see that if in certain nations, if you didn't agree with the majority, you were expelled. You didn't have individualism. In the West, we have individualism, so you get to give your opinion, which is good in a way. But in those days, in those nations, if you weren't with the times or you didn't believe what they believed, they would expel you. And we see this in our nation too. We've had, we see politicians, when they have coups, what happened? When they have a coup, the politician has to seek refuge in a different country. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, in this first ver verse, that the arrogant chiefs they wanted to expel Shu'aib alayhi salam. Um, then the next verse, Qadif tarayna ala Allahi kathiban in Udna, till the end. They said that we would surely be fabricating a lie against Allah if we were to return to your faith. Sh Shu'aib alayhi salam said, Even if you expel me, I'm not turning back on my faith. He said, Go ahead, expel me. Kick me out of the, uh, you know, of the country, of the area. Because our iman is more important. Allah has saved us from it. It does not befit us to return to it Allah unless it is the will of Allah. So he said, once Allah has given us Iman, we can't go back now. Regardless of what happens. And we saw this with the Sahaba. Iman came, then they, they, they withheld, they, they stood strong, regardless of what punishments. We saw what happened to Bilal radiallahu when he became Muslim. And he was lashed in the hot sand. But he said, Ahad, Allah is one. I have Iman now. So when, the, when the, that strength, that huwa of Iman comes into one's heart, then you're able to deal with a lot of the atrocities around you. So this is similar for us. When we start really feeling secure in our identity as Muslims, it, don't, it won't matter what Islamophobes say. It won't matter what, uh, you know, us living in the West, that won't affect us or our children. We need to build strong identity. So identity is very important. Yesterday I talked about the clothing, but the clothing was what? It was about creating identity. Identity starts here. It starts here, and it has to do with how you look, but it starts mentally. So this is very important for us. And then there's a wonderful dua for us here in this verse. Um, wonderful dua. If any of us are going through any difficulty, any, any, you know, there's some harm that might come to us, or we're, just, we're in a pressurized situa situation, Allah says in this verse, in this verse, وَسِيَ عَرَبُّنَا كُلَّ شَيْنْ عِلْمًا عَلَى اللَّهِ تَوَكَّلْنَا The dua is right here. رَبَّ نَفْتَحْ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَ قَوْمِنَا بِالْحَقِّ وَأَنْتَ خَيْرُ الْفَاتِحِينَ And that means, um, O oh Lord, إِفْتَحْ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَ قَوْمِنَا Open for us in our nation. And وَأَنْتَ خَيْرُ الْفَاتِحِينَ You are the best people, you are the best of those who open ways when things look closed. When things look dark, you are the one who can open anything. So, this is a, a beautiful dua for us to sort of memorize. رَبَّنَا افْتَحْ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَ قَوْمِنَا بِالْحَقِّ وَأَنْتَ خَيْرُ الْفَاتِحِينَ uh, And so we have impending difficulties. Learn this dua and we can mention this dua. So any dua that's in the Qur'an, those are, these are the most beautiful duas. So here's one right here. At the time of difficulty or some extreme pressure. رَبَّنَا افْتَحْ بَيْنَنَا Oh Allah, open the way when no one else can open the way. So what this is, is this dua is in a sense, what are you telling Allah? that I've forsaken all other, I'm trying to receive help from all other forces. I come to you. Ruju ilallah. This is ruju ilallah, meaning, yes, I'll, you know, once, what happens when, when we face difficulty in our lives, the first thing we do is we do everything else first, and the last thing we go, let me make two rakats, let me go to the masjid. Right, that's the last thing we do. Allah is saying, 
Do that. Do everything. Do whatever you need to do. Take care of your business. But start with first two rak- First start with make ruju to me first. Then take the worldly measures to correct your, your issues. So this is very important. Let's not, we do the opposite a lot of times. We go, we try everything. Oh man, can this guy help me? This connection will help me. That person can help me. This, and then at the end we say, oh, let's make oh, dua, can you? let's make dua, I need to make dua, I need to make salah. Let's change the cycle. Make two rakats first. Then start your worldly measures of how to come out of this difficulty. Very important. Then uh, we have discussion of five to six prophets, but there's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of breeze over that and go straight. There's a very detailed discussion of Musa a.s. So let's go through that discussion together. It's very detailed in this just. So I think instead of um, talking about some of these other verses, let's go straight. And Musa a.s. compared to Salih a.s., Lut a.s., um, th- you know, and all these other prophets, there's five to six prophets, there's the, the most amount of detail from verse 103 is mentioned in regards to Musa a.s. There's like six other prophets. But Allah briefly mentions them, and then he, there's a detailed discussion about Musa a.s. So one reason there's a lot of detail is because Musa a.s. had a lot of resemblance with our, with our Prophet wasallam and his ummah and, our, and things that we can learn from their ummah. So that's why there's a lot of detail. And our ummah should not have the attitude of ignorance. Right? The Bani Israel, we keep talking about it. Ignorance. Ignorance. The Bani Israel, they, 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 just, they continued to go against the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, Fir'aun, Fir'aun would claim lordship. Fir'aun, Ana Rabbukum al-A'la. Fir'aun said openly, I am the Lord. To Musa, I am the Lord. And this is something that we can relate to in our ummah. We have, we've also had people in our ummah who've claimed lordship or they've claimed, you know, we have certain people in the dunya, they don't directly say I'm the Lord, but their actions, you can perceive that this person thinks so highly of himself that he's a quote-unquote untouchable. It may be someone of wealth, someone of influence, right? Certain people in society, they might have some, for example, famous celebrity, scandal. They're not worried, why? We got the best lawyers, court, we'll take care of it. You, they, they basically feel like we're un, once you have money, in certain societies, you're untouchable. Or in certain societies, if you have political influence, you're untouchable. So this, in a way, Allah is saying, this is like Fir'aun's mentality. I'm untouchable. Ana rabbukum al-a'la. So Allah discusses Musa a.s. story to us. That, oh, oh, oh ummah of Rasulullah s.a.w. Don't fall on that trap. You are touchable. You're not untouchable. So this is the reason why Musa a.s. discussion is way more, it's deeper and it's more vast than the other prophets. So these are two reasons the ulama mentioned why there's so much discussion of Musa a.s. So let's get into it inshallah. Let's try to follow along because this is basically the detailed story we sort of touched on this in Surah Al-Baqarah, but here's more detail, inshallah. So, first let's talk about how did Musa alayhi salam and Fir'aun, how did they meet? Right, we always hear about this. So well, how did they meet? So what happened is, we know that there was, always, there was droughts in the Holy Lands, right, where these people lived. And remember what happened to Yusuf alayhi salam, right? Yusuf alayhi salam, the son of Yaqub alayhi salam, and his 12 sons, and their 12 tribes is where the Bani Israel originated from. So at the time of Yusuf, Yusuf alayhi salam, remember his brothers, uh, he was in Egypt. And based on Yusuf alayhi salam's advice, um, they basically, the brothers, they had traveled to Egypt and that's where they came across Yusuf alayhi salam. They realized, oh my God, this is our brother. That same brother we threw into the well many years ago. Now he's a, he's a man of position in Egypt. But why did they go to Egypt? Because there was drought in the land of, of Yaqub alayhi salam. So he sent his sons, go to Egypt. There's more prominence there and you'll get supplies, right? So that's, that's similarly, that's what happened at the time. That's what happened with these people. Um, so this is something that have happened from the time of Yusuf a.s. that he had children and became, they became inhabitants. So when Yusuf a.s. brothers came and they found that, hey, this is our brother. And they, they know that the whole story is very detailed. We'll come to in Surah Yusuf. So once they went there, they decided to settle in those lands. The sons of Yaqub a.s. meaning Yusuf a.s. and his brothers. They settled in Egypt. They all settled in Egypt. And they became inhabitants of Egypt. And um, so they became, a, uh, once they became inhabitants there, over the time they became a, uh, the major, they became a huge minority. In the, so the huge minority in that land was the Bani Israel. Uh, known as the Coptics, right? These are, so this is what happened then. Unfortunately, over the years, many of the pharaohs, right? The pharaohs of those times, like Ramses II, or Medmetar, these are very famous, uh, uh, you can say pharaohs, 
Right, Ramses' body is still in the Egyptian museum. If you go to the Egyptian museum, you'll see Ramses II. He was also a, a pharaoh, just like Pharaoh. All these pharaohs, they started persecuting this, this minority. This minority, who was this minority? The Bani Israel. They started persecuting them. They start, basically, they had enslaved them, for lack of a better term. So the, the Bani Israel had become slaves. They'd become like indentured slaves at that time by all these different um, pharaohs. And Surah Qasas talks about how Musa a.s. up in the house of the Pharaoh. Musa a.s. he sees this persecution. Right, so Musa a.s. is from what? He's from that large minority. He's from the Bani Israel. And he sees that these Pharaohs like Pharaoh and Ramses the second and etc. They, they continue to persecute his people. They continue to persecute his people. So then he stands up to Pharaoh. So that's how Pharaoh and Musa a.s. meet. Originally he was a minority living in the land of Pharaoh and when Pharaoh and other uh, pharaohs like him they were oppressive over time Musa alayhi salam stood up to him Musa alayhi so that's how they came together and Musa alayhi salam claimed the prophecy then then Musa alayhi salam said I'm a prophet of Allah and then when he said this Pharaoh then said give me a sign give me some sign how are you a prophet of Allah so haqiqun ala alla aqula ala Allah illa al-haq right he said, I'm obliged to say nothing to you about Allah except the truth. So he said, yes, I am a prophet and I have come to give you da'wah of Allah. Indeed, I have come to you with clear proof from your Lord. So he, this is how he responded to Fir'aun. So that he told Fir'aun that I want to take the children of Bani Israel and leave this area because the persecution is great. I want, basically, we want to, we want to make hijrah. We want to leave. This is what Musa, this is Musa alayhi salam to Fir'aun. And then... The Pharaoh said, okay, if you believe that you are a prophet and you want to leave this land, I need to see some physical signs. I need to see something that prove to me with some miracles, with some miracles that you are a prophet. So now we, many of us have heard this story. Then Musa alayhi salam and then the Quran says, right? Uh, the Pharaoh says, فَأَلْقَى عَصَاهُ فَإِذَا هِيَ ثُعْبَانٌ مُبِينٌ Right? That the Pharaoh says, okay. I give you an opportunity to show me what, um, what type of magic that you possess. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given Musa alayhi salam two powerful uh, miracles. One was that he would, he would use his staff and when he would strike the ground it would become a, 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 you know, a huge snake. In our context, you know, the size of maybe an anaconda or the largest snake, a reticulated python for example. A huge thu'ban, huge snake. And also a second uh, miracle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave uh, Musa alayhi salam is that he would, he would, when he would remove his hand from his pocket, it would be illuminated. And this is something they'd never seen before. Because, I mean, they're not living in a time with electricity and lights and stuff. So his hand would be extremely bright. So this is, and this is amazing. Why did Allah give Musa alayhi salam these miracles? Because the Pharaoh had a lot of pride that we are the utmost leaders in magic. They believed they were the best, best magicians. That you know, when it comes to magic, Fir'aun believed that his, him and those close to him were the most powerful in magic. So when he saw these two particular signs, so Allah gave Musa salam, these two signs to combat what Fir'aun would be able to bring to the table. So then they had, you know, we, we know that in Tafsir, Tabri and Ibn Kathir mentions, that Ibn Abbas radiallahu anh, mentions that when, the, when Fir'aun saw these two miracles, um, he knew that the magicians couldn't, that possibly could not do this. So the Pharaoh jumped out of his seat, meaning Fir'aun saw these two things and he, he, almost, like he almost, he realized that this is, not, this is not simple magic, this is something else. But nonetheless, um, he knew that um, this man has this type of uh, you know, ability, this is not from himself, this is divine. So now he felt threatened. Before he was just, okay, you claim you have some powers, let's see what you have. When he saw this, he basically, uh, Musa Islam got his attention. And he said, this man is, is something more than just, he's not just a, your ordinary magician. So now Fir'aun is scared. Fir'aun is scared, so then, قَالَ الْمَلَأُ مِنْ قَوْمِ فِرْعَوْنَ إِنَّ هَذَا لَسَاحِرٌ عَلِيمٌ Fir'aun saw this, and then he said, he, saw, he told everyone around him, even though in his heart he didn't believe this, he said, wow, this is, he told all those people around him, this man possesses some powerful magic. Like that's some real, that's some serious magic, right? Even though in his heart he knew this wasn't magic. He said, this is real magic. And he said, let's call all of our magicians. So he said, get, get our best, get our best five. 
Sorry, five, right? Yet our best magician, I'm just saying sorry, five, you know, everything has, I have to give some sports examples. So he said, bring the best magicians of, the, of, of, our, of our nation. We have to, we have to, we have to, let's have a battle of sorts, right? If Musa Ali Islam can do this. Let's, let me show you what my magicians can do. So then Fir'aun calls all his magicians. The magicians are very excited. This is our chance. If we're able to defeat Musa, we become close to Fir'aun. Right? We become his like right hand man. So they're excited. Everybody's like, yes, this is it. We're going to crush this man. We have the tools. We have the magic. Right? So they have all this. This is a, the thought process. They, so then they threw first. Right? So they met and the, the magicians of Fir'aun, they, they, they started performing magic. They threw something onto the ground. And it created a, vi a vision or illusion. Meaning they had small sticks. And those small sticks they threw turned into small snakes. Small snakes. But Allah is saying, and the Mufassirun say, all this was, this was, when we go to a magic show, what do we see? We see something, it's all it is, is it's an optical illusion. Right? The small kids get surprised, put it here, take it out here, put it here, take it out here. It's, it's optical illusion, right? Magicians, they're masters of optical illusion. So Allah is saying that they didn't even have real, real mag magical ability. All it was was an optical illusion. So they threw down their sticks and they became small snakes. And they were like, all right, let's see what happens now. Then uh, Musa alayhi salam, وَأُوحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ مُوسَىٰ الْقِعْصَاتِ Then Allah says, we told Musa, now throw your stick down. Allah revealed to Musa, told Musa, alayhi salam, throw your stick down. فَإِذَا هِيَ تَلْقَفُ مَا يَأْفِقُونَ We inspired Musa and his, when he threw his stick down, it became an enormous, massive, powerful snake. It devoured all their snakes. Right through the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It devoured all the snakes. And when this happened, Allah says, the truth prevailed and their illusions failed. The truth prevailed and their illusions failed. So the truth uh, So the Pharaoh and his people were defeated right there. And they were put to shame. They were put to shame because their power was the, the whatever little magic they knew. Musa alayhi salam's was way more. You know, it, it inspired the people, uh, it, and it, it basically you know it, it showed them that they were not upon the truth. So immediately, all the magicians fell in sajda. All the magicians and they said, "Qalu amanna bi Rabbil alamin." Think about this: the magicians who were real magicians, they were they immediately realized this is not magic. Right? But Fir'aun, look at this, Fir'aun was so stubborn, stubborn. His own magicians, they fell into sajda and they said, وَأُلْقِيَ السَّحْرَةُ سَاجِدِينَ Fir'aun, we, uh, and they told uh, Musa alayhi salam, we believe in your Lord. Immediately they all accepted faith upon his hands. All the magicians. قَالُوا آمَنَّا بِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Fir'aun was so upset that he told his magicians that fell into sajda, he said, لَأُقَطِّعَنَّ أَيْدِيَكُمْ I am going to cut your hands. وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ مِنْ خِلَافِ Meaning, not cut your hands. I'll cut your right hand and your left foot. Then a man is rendered completely useless. Right? If you cut his... He can't stand, he can't walk, he can't... So Fir'aun was upset. He said, I'm going to crucify all of you. All his magicians. لَأُقَطِّعَنَّ He wanted to put fear in their hearts. How dare you challenge me in front of Musa alayhi salam. ثُمَّ لَأُصَلِّبَنَّكُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ then I, will, then I will nail all of you to a cross. What did they say? They said, your threats mean nothing to us. قَالُوا amanna, Kill us if you want now. This man is upon haq, we follow him. We follow him. So this is the story of how they met and what happened. Um, so then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ إِسْتَعِينُوا بِاللَّهِ وَاصْبِرُوا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the people of Musa that seek assistance from Allah um, at all times. قَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ إِسْتَعِينُوا بِاللَّهِ وَاصْبِرُوا Right, inna al-arda lillah. Because now all those people who followed Musa alayhi salam, they were scared. That you just outclassed and you challenged Fir'aun. He, he's, he can, if he wants to, he can probably kill all of us right now. And immediately what verse is revealed? That Musa alayhi salam tells his people, he doesn't tell his people, you're right, we gotta run, we have to formulate a plan. Ista'inu billah. He says, seek assistance with Allah. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. So we have iman, we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear. إِسْتَعِينُوا بِاللَّهِ وَاصْبِرُوا إِنَّ الْأَرْضَ لِلَّهِ The earth is vast. يُورِثُهَا مَنْ يَشَاء Allah will inhabit this earth with whoever He wants. So if Allah wants to keep us alive, 
and give us respect and izzat, he'll give it to us. So the prophets are constantly in the Quran are teaching us, Ista'inu, Ista'inu, seek assistance with Allah, 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 Allah. And this is a message that we have to really take apart. You know, and then what's interesting is this same nation, now think about this, this same nation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them Musa alayhi salam and he protected them and he, he combated a, such a powerful Pharaoh, these same people, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved them, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala split the sea and they, they escaped and Musa, uh, Fir'aun's army went in and what happened? The water engulfed them. This same nation, after that, they started turning against Musa alayhi salam. Can you imagine? Musa alayhi salam has shown them so many miracles and so many things from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Soon as, soon as Fir'aun dies, they start turning on the Prophet This is a, and this is something that we have to be careful about, right? Na'udhu billah, we bite the hand that feeds you. Bite the hand that feeds you. Someone does some ihsan or some goodness for you in our context, we forget that. And we, later on in life, we turn against that same person. And that's what the Bani Israel, because they suffered from the biggest issue, the biggest issue was the ailment of the heart, is they had no gratitude. No gratitude. No gratitude. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for example, فَأَرْسَلْنَا The Pharaoh continued his affliction after this. So, before they even um, left, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did he do? فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمُ الطُّفَانِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plagued them with floods. Locusts, lice, frogs, and blood, one after another. Not all at once. He sent all these things upon them. And he, uh, these were clear signs for them, but they persisted in arrogance and were a wicked people. So a storm first ravaged them. It destabilized them. Then locusts started eating all their crops. So now they have no food. Then we said lice attacking their animals. So their livestock is gone. So no food, no, no water, livestock is gone. Then Allah sent... Uh, the what the uh, what the means frogs. Allah sent frogs, just so many frogs upon them that they would open their mouth and before they would close their mouth, they have frogs in their mouth. These are all adabs from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And when this happened, the same nation that was turning against Musa, they would go back to Musa alayhi salam and they would say, um, قالوا, ya Musa, lana. Oh Musa, we're sorry. Pray to your Lord. Pray to your Lord to remove these these calamities." Remove these calamities. And then, لَإِن كَشَفْتَ Soon as, uh, and then they said that if you remove these calamities, لَنُؤْمِنَنَّ لَكَ We will believe it. We promise. Last time. Last time we disobey you. وَلَنُرْسِلَنَّ مَعَكَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ But soon as Allah removed that punishment, عَنْهُمُ الرِّسَّ إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ هُمْ بَالِغُهُ They went back to how they were. So, no gratitude. This is over and over with the Bani Israel. Over and over. So, and we know that Musa alayhi salam had a lot of patience. He had a lot of patience with them. Now that Fir'aun is dead, and the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends him to the holy lands, Musa alayhi salam is now look, is looking after the Bani Israel. Now this is where Harun, Harun alayhi salam, his brother, comes into the picture. So Allah invites Musa, another incident, Allah invites Musa alayhi salam to Mount Tur, and he says, you have to stay here for 30 days. Stay here for 30 days. And then act and fast. After Musa alayhi salam finishes 30 days, Allah in His own wisdom says, I want you to stay here for 10 more days. So Musa alayhi salam says, okay, he completes 40 days. And while Musa alayhi salam has gone to Mount Tur, he leaves his brother Harun alayhi salam in charge. He says, look after the nation. Look after the Bani Israel. And what happens, again, while Musa alayhi salam is gone, they start indulging in strange behavior again. Soon as any time they have some respite from Allah's punishment, they go back to the old ways. Right? It's like a child that's disciplined, for example, and then go, 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 goes right back to it, goes right back to it. What do they do? A member from their community whose name is Samini, Allah mentions it in right, Jude 16. Samini, he takes a calf, a hollow calf, and he puts holes in it, and when the wind blew, this calf would make noises, so he, and then he told all of them that this is some type of living creature, make ibadah to this thing. After all that they've been through with Musa alayhi salam, they start worshipping a calf. So they start worshipping this calf. Harun alayhi salam tried stopping them. Harun alayhi salam, he tried his best to stop them. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to Musa alayhi salam and he goes back to his people. And when he goes back to his people, he says that in the absence of Musa, his people made, this ayah is, right? Uh, his people made from their golden jewelry an idol of a calf making a sound. They did not see that it could not speak, nor it could not guide them to the right path. 
Still, they took it as a God and were wrongdoers. Musa alayhi salam returns from the mountains and he's extremely upset and sorrowful. He's like, I went for your sake to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I come back and you're worshipping the calf. So then, he gets really upset to such an extent he grabs his brothers, he grabs Harun alayhi salam and is mentioned by his beard. Right? And he's like, you were supposed to be in charge. I go away for four, and these people are worshipping a calf. A calf of all things with holes inside of it. And the wind blows, so now they say that we have to worship this. They, they never use their intellect. Right? Harun alayhi salam says, Harun alayhi salam says, he tells his brother, he said, don't embarrass me. Don't humiliate me in front of these people. I made my best effort. But these people are so, you know, they're so caught up. They're so blinded that I could not stop them. I could not stop them. So Musa alayhi salam was someone we know that, you know, when, when he had, he was a person that he had anger for the sake of Allah. But with his people, he was so compassionate. We know the story of Musa alayhi salam. What's the story what, what, of that incident? Anyone remember? Anyone can recall it? When he smacked huh, a person, what happened to that person? He died. <laughs> he died. So now the question, why did he just start smacking people left and right? But look at this. That one incident, he, he was extremely upset, right? And that incident happened, it's coming later. But look at how he is with his nation. Every time they do something wrong, patience. Sabab. 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 He never, he never, you know, and that's why Musa, Musa alayhi salam is an example of patience. Like Yusuf alayhi salam. Like our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, these are like shiny examples of what patience can do. So these are just some examples of the Bani Israel. Um, then the Bani Israel told Musa Alayhi Salaam, if this wasn't enough, we want to talk to Allah directly. We want to speak to Him. We don't believe uh, it comes through a book. So Allah gave him the Torah, they said, no, we want to talk to Allah. So Musa Alayhi Salaam said, okay, I will take 70 of you. And then they spoke to Allah, and then even after speaking to Allah, they said, now we want to see you, Ya Allah. We want to see you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know I mentioned this with the Bani Israel. They were killed. And again, remember yesterday the first verse, Walaw Annana, it's radical skepticism. One sign after another, we want more. We want more. We want more. It's like that person, you know, for example, you get some people, they're very shaky. Right? He makes wudu, he comes, I, I, oh, I, I missed the spot. Go back, come back. Oh, I missed. They have, they're just involved, there's too much self doubt. Right? And then that self-doubt turns into skepticism. Everything, they're skeptical about everything. So these people were continuously skeptical. skeptical. So Imam Ghazali said that, you know, he, he gave a good, a good example to this skepticism. He said that a high level of skepticism will do this to a, pe to a person, what happened to the Bani Israel. He said, it's like a, he said their example of these people, Imam Ghazali, he said, it's like a dream. And when you awaken from the dream, he said, what happens usually when you wake up from a dream? It's like we're sleeping, we wake up, and then we realize now we're in real life, right? We're in reality. What if you wake up, and then you're like, what if I'm in a dream right now? What if everything that's happened, this is all just metaphysical. Right? I'm not even sitting here right now even talking to you guys. All of you are sleeping right now. So he said, their exa <laughs> the example of these people is like this. That's the level of skepticism. They wake up from a dream, and then they start thinking, am I even awake? Maybe I'm still dreaming. Right? So Imam Ghazali, he said that this is the sickness that they suffered from and that radical skepticism, this is, this is almost like an adab that they, they suffer from and this is to show our ummah, be careful of this, be careful of this. Right? So that Musa alayhi salam, he, he, go, he goes up with 70 people, they want to see Allah, those, those people are killed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them life again. So this is, this is some verses about Musa alayhi salam. Uh, I'll go towards the end, this is all Surah Al-A'raf. I mentioned the story of the Sabbath and the Khatira, right? So there's a, there's a lot of lessons in there, especially about we should not write off our brothers and sisters. We have to continue to give them da'wah towards the right path. If they're not practicing Islam, try to bring them closer. That's our job, right? Our job is through the good character that Islam teaches us, bring people to Islam. And that doesn't always mean point out their negativities, I mentioned. You do good and your good, inshallah, will spark something in them. And you talk and you speak to many da'is, they don't, you know, they don't necessarily, when they meet people that they want to, you know, you're getting da'wah to, don't tell them that, hey, what commandments of Allah are you not following? When I tell youngsters, as always, when you're young people, they, they ask me, like, I have friends, they're not practicing faith, they're away from Islam, they're Muslim families, families, what should we do? Should we talk to them about Islam? Should we tell them to come to the masjid? I said, no, don't do that. I said, first develop the friendship. Be a good friend with them. 
So if they want to hang out, you hang out with them. Right? Because what are you to them? You are good company to their bad company. That they are, they're, they're with bad company. You be that good company for them. And when you're with them, initially, don't talk about Islam. No Islam. No, don't talk about namaz, roza, come to the masjid. Even if they're sinning, major sins, leave them for a bit. When they trust you, when they know that this guy really cares about me, this guy, you know, when, they, when you develop a friendship, and then they see that, man, you know, because what happens eventually, and I've experienced this, these types of people, they hang out with individuals that don't even care about them. It's just about a lifestyle. And that lifestyle wears off, and they realize that, man, this guy who's calling me to khayr is my only true friend. This guy that's always going to the masjid, he's never called me to the masjid. Man, he's, he's the only guy that comes through for me when I need him. That will be the way that they come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is very, very important, especially for youngsters, because they always come with these types of stories and incidents. Uh, there's, a story, there's a few other stories, again, because of time, inshallah, I'm going to finish it up. Uh, also in this story, we have, in this juz, we have Suratul Anfal. Suratul Anfal, Anfal means spoils of war. So in Suratul Anfal, Allah talks about the battle of Badr in detail. Uh, the beginning of this surah is very beautiful. Allah is talking about the distribution of the, of the war booty, which is spoils of war. They had a dispute at, after Badr. The Sahaba should take how much? So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about that. Um, the discussion of Badr, you know, we should, all, we should all read about the battle of Badr in detail. Uh, it's very, very important for us. Um, but we won't get into that. So basically, Al-A'raf finishes. And Anfal, the last quarter of nine juz, is about... Um, it's about the battle of Badr, but Allah mentions five characteristics in the beginning of this, and I'll, I'll finish with this, because we're in the month of Ramadan, we need to, as many characteristics the Quran talks about, let's implement them. What are the five characteristics Allah says? إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ Number one, uh, that are five characters of a good believer. So we need to, let's look at these and inculcate these in our lives. Number one, he, has, he fears Allah when he's alone. It's easy when people are around you. All of us, my ustad used to tell us that if we were students of knowledge, right? We're still, and we're all still students of knowledge, but he would tell all of us, if you are to die, each one of you, he said, if any one of you dies, and after your death, you are to look into, you know, whether it be, whether it be your phone, your, your, your entire private life should be clean. As far as, there should be nothing that comes up that shows that you lived your life with taqwa, fearing Allah when no one was watching you. It's easy when we're all together. What are you doing when no one's watching? That's taqwa. Number two, uh, obey Allah and His Messenger and do not run away from them. So we obey Allah and His Messenger in all situations. Number three, respond to your Lord and Prophet when they call to you from that which gives you life. So responding to Allah and His Rasul means follow the dictates of Islam. Number four, and then number four is what will you get if you fear Allah? He will provide for you the criteria, meaning when you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right from wrong will become clear for you. Some people, they can't, they can't even differentiate between right and wrong. Think about that blessing we have. Some people feel like they're doing right, but they're doing wrong their whole life. Right? So they haven't even give, been given the ability to discern right from wrong. That's Allah saying, I'll give you that ability if you have my taqwa. Number five, do not betray Allah and His Messenger by betraying people's trust. Amana. Right? No khiyana. If someone gives you something or you are trusted with someone, someone tells you something in privacy, and then, hey, I'm going to tell you something, but don't tell anybody else. You've already broken that trust. Right? So don't break the trust. So these five qualities of a believer, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions. I'll just go through the points of conclusion, then we'll finish, inshallah. Shu'aib alayhi salam, then the story of Musa alayhi salam has many lessons. Musa alayhi salam was a ruler and was told to hold on to the divine message. Verse 145. Number two, Musa alayhi salam is told to hold strong to his faith and he'll be strong in the earth for many years to come. Number three, Allah's mercy encompasses everything. Number four, there's a story of Bal'um ibn Bara. He had, a lots of no he had lots of knowledge, right? He had a lot of ilm, but he became arrogant. We didn't discuss that story. Number, the next one, discussion of beginning of creation and the covenant with Adam alayhi salam. We didn't discuss that too. With akhada rabbuka min bani Adama min When we all were born, and in the hadith it mentions that we were we came out from the loins of Adam alayhi salam as small as like ants. All of humanity came. And when we came out, Allah took a covenant from each one of us. What's amazing is we don't remember that covenant now. But Allah says on the day of Qiyamah, you will remember that covenant. That, that you only, Allah asked, who is your Lord? 
Qalu bala. Is there any Lord but Allah? We all said, no, Allah is our Lord. So right now, because we're in this dunya, we don't remember taking that, but the, 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 the narrations mentioned, on the day of Qiyamah, we all will actually remember taking that oath from the time of Adam alayhi salam. وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَبَ Right now we're in a certain state that Allah has made it out. None of us, it's like, for example, when you wake up or you had a dream, don't know, but weeks later you're like, man, something happens in real life and you connect it to that dream. Well, I had a dream about this. That's what's going to happen on that day. Disco and then there's a discussion of the beginning of creation, the covenant of Adam. I mentioned that. Surah Anfal starts and the war spoils are discussed. The battle of Badr has many lessons, right? Inshallah, maybe we'll touch on some of them tomorrow. Tomorrow there's a lot of discussion about the, the, the um, hypocrites and how they're exposed. Allah exposes them and Allah's promise to be faithful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of us tawfiq inshallah to practice upon what's being heard to the best of our abilities and to, you know, to, and to create a love and muhabba in our hearts for the Quran inshallah. This, this, this program that we're having every single day, I, I, had, I only have one niyyah. Is that we, we listen to Tarabi for years and years and years. We come for this. Those night prayers. And it's the listening, just listening to the Quran is a huge blessing. But we wanted to create some attachment. If you can hear some of the stories and what the Quran is saying. Now I hope that after Ramadan, maybe when you have free time, you're going to pick up a translation or a tafsir and say, hey, I, want to, I want to keep doing this. So each day, this is the point. Let's build a ta'alluq with the Quran. Right? Listening to the Quran is very important. One time the Prophet ﷺ told a sahabi, recite. And he started reciting. This is just about the kalam. Because I don't want to make, people should think that, hey, what about just listening is not so. So he told the Prophet, Prophet told him, the Sahabi, I don't, I, it might be Ibn Abbas, but I'm, I'm, I'm not for sure. Nonetheless, he told him, recite. So the Sahabi told him, oh Prophet, the Quran was revealed to you and you want me to recite it too. Meaning you're the best of reciters. He said, no. I also, the Quran is revealed to me, but I also love to hear the Quran. So the Sahabi started reciting. And then when he came to the verse, فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا How is it that we, when we bring مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ الشهيد, From all the nations, a witness, and a witness above, above them will be Rasulullah So when he looked up, the Prophet's eyes were tearing, he was crying profusely. So we should love listening to the Qur'an. We should love reciting the Qur'an. And we should love, you know, the tafsir and the explanation and uh, basically the translation, the tarjuma. Every aspect of the Qur'an is important, inshallah. So let's build, we want to build that muhabbat. And that's the main focus in this month of Ramadan. Allah accept. Yeah. yeah. You guys told me that five minutes earlier, then. It's too late. Yeah, we'll do it tomorrow, inshallah. Oh, jazakallah. I, I didn't even remember that. I forgot. So tomorrow, we'll, it's, we're just... Briefly go over that conversation between the, jahan, the people of paradise and the people of the fire, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Subhanallah wa bihamdi. Subhanallah wa bihamdi. Inshallah wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiru wa tubi laik. One of the brothers, mashallah, this brother, um, what's his brother's name? Brother Samir, mashallah. A few days ago I mentioned um, the fruits of the Quran. So the brother, mashallah, he bought uh, an abundant supply of pomegranates for everybody. So whoever wants can take, inshallah. Because he said that because we talked about it, he wants to also, you know, just make amal, inshallah. So whoever wants can take it, and we can even have it right here. It's you know, it's a, it's it's fresh. Uh, yeah, this is for everybody, mashallah. Because he said he heard that the olives and the pomegranate are mentioned in the Quran. So mashallah, this is uh, immediate practice, immediate amal upon something, right? Umar radhiyallahu said that I would not read a verse until I would practice it and then move to the next verse. MashaAllah. So we all thank him. Jazakumullah khay. Assalamu alaikum. So this is for anyone that wants one, inshallah. You know, help yourself. The kids, right? You gotta do some work though. You gotta kind of crack through it and all that, but very tasty.